Stevenson's rocket heralded a new era of mass travel, mass production, and mass communication. No change in human activity since the dawn of agriculture 10,000 years ago has had such a profound impact on daily life. The iron horse has a pedigree which stretches back to the taming of the first farm animals. The final challenge facing the historians is to trace back the seeds of capitalism to the end of hunter-gathering, when human beings first began to control nature. Long before steam power, we harnessed water power and wind power. And before that, animal power. The puzzle is why this only happened in some parts of the world. Why were some people catching trains while others were still catching animals? Were some animals more equal than others? Were some people more equal than others? Think about the road that humanity has traveled over the last 10,000 years. We have come down from small tribes of hunter-gatherers to very, very large groups who dine at McDonald's. Um, has this been an improvement? Is this in some sense better? Has it all been uh, for the best? Uh, people are going to disagree about that. Many believe that the first 50,000 years when we used to hunt game and gather wild plants was the most idyllic form of human existence. When we gave up the nomadic life and settled down, we stopped living in harmony with nature and left the Garden of Eden. I think that when we were hunter-gatherers, we invented most of what really matters about being human. We invented our families, our language, our religion, music, dance, poetry, many of the really good things in life. And I'm not quite sure what we've gathered uh, since, actually. Well, I mean, in all due respect to hunter-gatherers who probably had a jolly good life, a great deal of what we call human culture is the product of urban environments yes. that were capable of producing a Rembrandt and a Mozart. You and I wouldn't have a job, certainly. You, well, that too. Of course, we cannot experiment and you know, bring back a hunter-gatherer 10,000 years into a McDonald and ask him what he thinks about a cheeseburger. People have to eat. That problem has remained basically the same over 10,000 years. Uh, what has changed is the efficiency with which we are able to extract these things uh, from nature. Now, in a hunting-gathering society, the problem was only a very small number of people could be sustained because it was necessary for the animals to roam around wild. So as long as the number of persons around was fairly small, living on a fairly large area. This was a lifestyle that could be sustained and was for hundreds of thousands of years. Ten thousand years ago, the first agriculture began in Mesopotamia and China. Outside the continent of Eurasia, hunter-gathering continued. Agriculture probably began with hunter-gatherers returning to places where they had planted seeds from their favorite food. When they settled, farming became more intensive and they started to use animals to share the burden.
In this remote area of Nepal, the hardships of farming without the aid of machinery, electricity, or even wheels can be seen. For the last 30 years, anthropologist Alan McFarlane has been studying the people who live in this Himalayan village. They inhabit a pre-industrial society, so their day-to-day -day lives can yield clues as to how and why our ancestors began to exert control over nature. In the barns under their houses are the first links in a chain that in other parts of the world led to the Industrial Revolution. This baby buffalo represents one of the two great revolutions in human history. For 50, 60,000 years, human beings on this earth had gained their living by hunting and gathering. And then came the animal and the plant. And then you had a life of toil and war and oppression for many centuries from which we perhaps have just escaped. So one wonders why human beings bothered to domesticate animals and plants if it was possibly a disaster. The reason really is that human beings are very poorly endowed with natural abilities. If you look at their bodies, they don't have fur or feathers, so they have to have clothes. Their eyesight is not very good, so anything that can extend that is good. Their ears are not very good, they haven't got a very good sense of smell, so they employ dogs as a surrogate for their noses. Their teeth, they don't have good chomping teeth, they don't have claws, they can't run very fast. So basically they're a wreck, they really don't have much going for them except a very good brain. So basically if they're going to get anywhere at all, they have to harness through tools the external world. Now we tend to think of tools and the, as extensions of the human body and we tend to think therefore of things like hoes and plows. In fact, an animal is another human tool. In this case what was being extended was the human gut and the human stomach. Humans again have very poor stomachs, they can't digest very much. For instance, if I try and eat this leaf, this tough leaf from the forest, I'd start chewing it and I'd get terrible stomach ache and I wouldn't be able to release the energy in this at all. On the other hand, if I hand it to my friend here, he will digest it and it will go through this huge intestinal system and it will come out as three things which are enormously beneficial for human beings. One is milk, the second is meat, if you cut off its head, and the third is manure to put on the field. So this is the first human being's machine, a machine for turning energy from the sun through plants to human use. Like all machines, this one requires careful maintenance. These oxen each consume three or four loads of fodder a day, which must be carried down from the forest above. So there is a penalty attached to rearing animals. They require a lot of human effort. The reward is the ability to harness their energy to produce crops. Until the advent of railways, there were only two ways of transporting loads across land, the human back or the beast of burden. So domestic animals were a vital step in the replacement of human labor. Yet this change was largely confined to Europe and Asia. The distribution of domesticated animals was unevenly spread across the world. By 4000 BC, goats, sheep, cows, pigs and horses were being domesticated across the continent of Eurasia. These animals we regard as farmyard animals today did not exist elsewhere. In the Americas and Australia, most of the major mammals became extinct as a result of overhunting or severe climate changes. Only bison and kangaroos were left in significant numbers. And it's hard to plow with a kangaroo. The puzzle is Africa. With so many animals and such diversity of species, why was animal power not harnessed on this continent? One theory is that some animals may be intrinsically wilder than others. The main 
reason why you want to domesticate animals is they perform certain services for you. Some, some of them give you motive power, like horses and oxen. You know, some of them are used in, in, in mills and industrial usage. They give you transportation. They give you dairy products. All of these things you cannot really get unless the animals are tame, unless they are relatively well behaved, unless they are calm, unless they are user friendly, we would say today. It turns out that there are very few animals in the world who can be bred to, dis to exhibit these properties. This is one of them. But there aren't that many of them. If you look to animals that are in many ways quite similar genetically, uh, like wildebeest in Africa or, or bisons in America, uh, they're just sufficiently different to not to be, to be uh, domesticable. The same is true, for instance, for zebras and horses. Horses and donkeys can be domesticated. Zebras, so far, nobody has succeeded. The point is that the Europeans and the Asians were uniquely fortunate by having these animals around and building large chunks of their material culture on the existence of animals. Perhaps the animals of Africa, where hominids have lived longer than on any other continent, evolved characteristics which made them hard to hunt and even harder to domesticate. African animals have been exposed to human predators much longer than Eurasian animals. The people of Europe and Asia had the good fortune to have a wide variety of relatively docile, fast-growing, easily fed animals. By enslaving them, Eurasians could travel further and faster, eat better and work harder than the inhabitants of any other continent. However, there are other explanations of this unique growth in parts of Eurasia. Alan McFarlane believes that people only abandon hunter-gathering when there is no choice. If there are no animals left to hunt, or the desert begins to encroach, farming becomes a survival strategy. In one or two places which were very rich soil areas along river deltas like Mesopotamia, you got pop predation building up and building up. And so you began to get intensification of agriculture. When they became serious farmers, they began to produce regular surpluses. And this leads into hierarchy. People come along and say, look, I'm a bit stronger than you. I would like a certain cut in your crops. So you get the development of the state and of private property and you get a land-holding class and a warrior class who force the peasantry to work very hard and to give them taxes. Whereas in Africa and Australia and South America, although it happened a little bit in South America, people, if they were told, you go and dig eight hours a day there and give me half your produce, they say, no thanks, I'm off. There's a huge amount of space over there and there and they just disappear, they vote with their feet. Well, if you're stuck in a little narrow river valley uh, of good land, you really can't leave. And very soon, the people in charge have the military power and the social power to force you, and you get the development of slavery, serfdom, hierarchy, military conquest. The consequences of settling were far-reaching. It meant more food could be produced, which in turn meant more people could be supported. The ability to produce surplus food freed citizens to develop new skills. What began as simple hobbies developed into specialized crafts. People were no longer equal. Some controlled the destiny of others. It was in the first cities that technological innovation really began to take off. When you look out over a crowded city with hundreds of thousands of people living closely together, you marvel at humanity's ability to have created the wealth to have moved from the simple life of hunters and gatherers to city civilizations about 5,000 years ago. Now, what did it need 
to make that possible. It needed new technologies like pottery, weaving, iron working. It needed new forms of social organization like the state and financial organization like taxation and ways of integrating people like religion. And once you had this package together, you could make a city and a city civilization. And this was the first great breakthrough. But it only occurred in certain places. It really only occurred in Europe and Asia, that is Eurasia. The stage was now set for another crucial development, which again can be traced back to animals. To take part in city life, citizens had to be able to buy and sell their surplus crops and animals. The market became the hub of city living. In order for markets to function efficiently, there had to be records of transactions. This led to one of the most important prerequisites for industrial society, to be able to write things down. We tend to wonder about how writing was invented, and most of us, because we use writing for communicating ideas, we think that perhaps it was something to do with that. But it's probable that the original purpose of writing systems was to act as a way of storing information and transmitting information so that you could do practical things with it. You could raise taxes, you could have the concept of private property, and you could exchange things. And when someone wanted something from a distance, you could write to them. When you wanted to keep a debt recorded, then you could write. So that trade, markets, and writing are all intimately linked with cities and all the other technologies of modernity. It is no coincidence that the first writing occurred where the first animals and plants were domesticated. Writing was not needed in hunter-gathering societies. So while most parts of the world relied on oral culture, literacy spread across Europe and Asia. What we have here is a cuneiform text made with, uh, by pressing reed pen, making wedge-shaped marks on clay. It comes from 1300 BC and it is an early example of a commercial document because it is a contract for the sale of a young slave woman for 43 pieces of silver. This thing's baked, it stands as a record. We're not any longer dependent on someone's memory of whether the thing happened or not. We have a written record, which has come down to us today. If we wanted to dispute the legality of this sale of this poor young woman, we certainly could. And it marks a, an immense transition in human society when you can create records independent of what there is in people's heads, the songs they can remember, the lists of ancestors they can recite. So writing is something we have to think about as being absolutely crucial in certain deep societal changes that come not too long after the development of urban civilizations based on settled agriculture. Hunter-gathering societies passed on their knowledge and traditions by singing songs and telling stories. But oral history was unreliable. For agricultural societies to function efficiently, they needed written documents to provide accurate, permanent records. Writing took fleeting inner thoughts and engraved them as external truths. Ideas took on a life of their own and could travel to the ends of space and time. These ideas could reach an even wider audience when hand copying by scribes was replaced by woodblock printing. When ideas were printed, they spread further and had a more lasting effect. The introduction of interchangeable metal type increased the volume and the diversity of printed material. This is a mill, but the fascinating thing which is difficult to realize is that most mills produce physical goods, bits of clothing or whatever it is. This is the only kind of mill that produces knowledge. Because from very early on, what it produces was identical pieces of knowledge. 
So in a sense, the printing works were the first factories producing identical goods. But they weren't bits of clothing, they were books or ideas. And you have a, a great enigma. In the West, there are many books about how printing revolutionized Western yes. theory. And it transformed it, uh, mm. our world, gave us science, gave us Protestantism. Yes. The European map of the great print houses just is the European map of the development and spread of the new sciences. With, without printing, you can't conceive of how the Renaissance, the Reformation, or the scientific revolution could really have happened yes. the way they did. China invented printing mm. and used it for some long period before the West, well, and it doesn't yeah. seem to have been, as Reisman called it, the gunpowder of the mind no. in China. It, it doesn't explode was, the society. Almost, if anything, the reverse, because uh, it just shows you, I think, that there is no such thing as a technology that just consists of the material means for doing particular kinds of things. The software that goes with it matters, if anything, very often much more. Even though movable type was originally invented in the East, the thousands of different characters made it very difficult to use. In the Chinese language, there are 80,000 characters. Imagine you were in charge of a Japanese newspaper at the end of the 19th century when they tried to use movable type before computers. How long do you think it would take you, given that you have, say, 18 times 6,000 characters to set from? And how would you set about doing it? <laughs> I think you would need a lot of manpower. Yes. And I think, in a way, it would be quite impossible, or, you know, you know especially they... for a daily newspaper. Nothing illustrates the problem better than the mechanical typewriter. In the West, fingers can type out the 26 letters by striking a keyboard. In the East, this was not possible. A Japanese typist had to memorize the location of thousands of different characters laid out on trays. It was like a micro-printing press, with each piece of type being individually selected. So even though the Chinese invented printing, in Europe, the Roman alphabet enabled a faster, more flexible printed word to become a vital ingredient in the engine of social change. Europe had another advantage. It was the only part of Eurasia where printing was not rigidly controlled by the state. This played a crucial role in the rise of the West. Europeans became heirs to a huge body of stored knowledge, which enhanced the potential of every reader to contribute further to the exploration and understanding of the natural world. There was an enormous curiosity in Europe. It always wanted to know about what was happening on the edges. People went gallivanting around the globe, but they often went with notebooks or the equivalent, wrote down things and came back, and you got these travelers' accounts and the botanists' accounts. All this fast flow of not new knowledge came into Europe. So while the West was absorbing the knowledge of all the civilizations of the world, other civilizations were either closing themselves off or not very interested. And the real tool that allowed this was the book. Timetables, Tickets and advertising were all part of the legacy of printing, which was vital to the opening of the Manchester to Liverpool Railway. There would have been no train service without printing, no printing without writing, no writing without markets, no markets without produce, and no produce without settled agriculture. The domestic animals which started this process would play another important role in the Western conquest of the rest of the world. When European explorers set out to discover new continents, they unwittingly embarked on a program of transoceanic genocide. Wherever they sailed, they brought death and damnation. If you'd been standing on this beach 250 years ago, you might have witnessed an extraordinary encounter. On the mainland of Australia was an ancient civilization perhaps 50,000 years of human development. 
And then coming in from the sea, Captain Cook and his expedition, bringing in a new technological world of shipping, weapons, food, social organization, and encountering here this ancient civilization of hunting and gathering people who had quickly evolved and then apparently remained more or less stationary for 40,000 years. The lush, untamed world of these hunter-gathering tribes looked ripe for exploitation to the Europeans who first landed on these shores. There was no one here except the local tribes such as the Biribi, who were hunters and gatherers and who went through the forests taking the fruit and the animals. Then Westerners arrived, drove off the natives, came into these forests, logged the timber, grew their cattle and corn, and almost all the native population was destroyed. This happened not just in Australia, but all over the world, and that is the terrible cost of technological growth. The question is, why does one civilization essentially survive and ends up in a position to dominate the rest of the globe, whereas the other civilizations, by and large, disappear as living bodies and have to be resurrected by archaeologists. There is a very deep question about the dominance of Europeans over non-Europeans. It's basically everywhere all over the world. Between 1480, say, and 1600, the Europeans spread over the four corners of the globe. Some of them looking for gold, some of them preaching the Bible, some of them then looking for adventure or for land or for whatnot, but nobody ever shows up in Europe. Yes, I wouldn't like, that's exactly, I wouldn't like to get into this game of saying one is richer or better. The real other. issue, of course, is still what explains the victory of Europe in the simple sense that today in Peru, they speak Spanish, but in Spain, nobody speaks the language oh, wow. that the Inca spoke. The civilizations of South America were more sophisticated than those of Australia. Yet European assaults on the Inca and Aztec empires had equally devastating effects. How did Europeans manage to take over continents so successfully? There's a certain ruthlessness, a certain uh, uh, ag aggression that, that, that I think is, is something that these native people have perhaps not entirely encountered. The, you know, the, the way in which the Europeans cheat and lie and trick uh, these populations as well. And so the key there is a mixture of hypocrisy and violence. I think so, but violence that is, it's not just that they're violent, it's, it's, the, they're the or, it's organized violence which, and the organization is better. Perhaps European weapons, the product of centuries of warfare between rival states, also gave them the edge. But industrialized violence alone fails to explain how 168 Spanish soldiers could overpower 80,000 Inca warriors. But certainly the fact that they had arms made out of steel uh, uh, did make a difference. But remember, they were the, the numerical odds were absurd. I mean, you had a handful of people against entire armies. It seems unlikely that with the kind of guns that the Europeans brought along with them, that it would have been easy for them to wipe out millions and millions of people who lived here in 1492. It's just unthinkable. What killed the majority of natives was not weapons, but the germs that came with the Europeans and their domestic animals. The very animals that had given the continent of Eurasia an advantage in the first place would now help Europe conquer the world. In America, there aren't any large domestic animals to speak of. Uh, the biggest thing that they have going for them are things like turkeys in Mexico and uh, llamas and the Andes and um, you know, dogs everywhere, but nothing like what Europeans have in terms of cows and, and horses. And as a result, the, the kind of farming that Europeans find here is uh, completely different. And when they show up and start introducing their own kind of farming, and they bring animals like this to America, obviously they change the entire ecology of the continent. 
300 years ago, mm. this area of Australia would have been woodland with hunters and gatherers wandering through it. Now it's a part of Europe. It has the barbed wire and of course it has the cows. What is surprising is that this is an example of what some historians have called ecological imperialism. That is the imitating of European agriculture in totally different climates in North America, Australia and elsewhere. And you get a, a bundle of things, not just the cows and the barbed wire, but also all the diseases, the pests, the weeds, the dandelions, all those things came with it. And it changed the whole ecology, the whole social system, and made most of the world look like bits of Europe. It was Europe's domestic animals that ultimately caused the tragic consequences across the continents. Diseases like influenza, measles, tuberculosis and smallpox, all originated in animals. Europeans, having been exposed to these germs, had developed resistance, but the native populations were totally unprotected. In Europe, microorganisms, microparasites, uh, jumped from people to animals and back. Now, at first glance, that sounds like a terrible thing, but if that's going on for hundreds and hundreds of of years, then gradually through self-selection and uh, growth of the immune system, uh, most of these diseases become less lethal uh, and less devastating. When the Europeans show up in America with their animals and with their microbes, uh, the uh, devastation that they inflict on the domestic population, on the local population, is just unbelievable. One very striking example of this kind of unintentional bacteriological warfare that Europeans conducted against the American Indians is what happened to the Mandan tribe of North Dakota in the 1830s. The Mandan Indians have been an agricultural settlement of people who grew things like corn and vegetables and fruit along the Missouri River. And they had maintained excellent relations with the Europeans until one day a paddle steamer called the St. Peter's, carrying fur traders, ended up in their territory. One of the persons aboard was infected with smallpox, and somehow that person infected the abandoned tribe. And within literally weeks, the vast majority of the local population passed away to the point where there's a famous speech preserved by a chief of the band named Four Bears. I have been in many battles and often wounded, but the wounds of my enemy I exalted in. But today I am wounded, and by whom? By those same white dogs that I have always considered and treated as brothers. The Mandan suffered the fate of most native peoples of the Americas and Australia. By the 1830s, the North American continent was open to exploitation by European settlers, and the largest migration in human history began. In just a few decades, hunter-gathering would give way to industrial agriculture. The native bison will be replaced by cattle stock imported from Europe. Open prairies would become the biggest grain fields on the planet. There was only one thing holding America back. Its sheer size. The larder of the Midwest was a thousand miles from the dining rooms of New York and Philadelphia. The solution to this problem was a snorting little animal that ran on rails. At the time of the rocket, few realized its potential to shrink continents. As late as 1830, 
Most of the people who thought and wrote about the issue of transportation over land did not realize the enormous potential that this contraption would have. You could build railroads almost anywhere. They could go, get to go in almost any weather. They didn't dry up. They didn't freeze over. Even if they were snowed under, it was fairly easy to remove the snow and keep the trains rolling. What it did was it made the Midwest into eventually the uh, grain supply, not just of the United States, but of the rest of Europe as well. The small village of Chicago at the foot of Lake Michigan was ideally placed to exploit the wheat from the prairies, timber from the pine forests, and cattle from the Midwestern ranches. It became the hub of a vast rail network linking the agricultural heartland of the West to the cities of the East. Chicago became the world's largest industrial complex, turning rural produce into city commodities. Its most famous product was meat. By 1870, Chicago's Union Stockyard had grown to over a hundred acres. This was carnage on a truly industrial scale, production line butchery that became known as the disassembly line. Most of the animals were in the west and the people who ate them were in the east. So this was a natural place to do the slaughtering and ship them back east by train. Now, the production system as it developed in Chicago is a very interesting and original adaptation of the conveyor belt. Each worker practices one very limited, highly specialized task such as cutting off one particular piece of the animal and then the product keeps moving on to the next person. A pig comes in alive and an hour later it is completely dismembered and ready to go into things like pork chops, sausages, spare ribs and so on and so forth. So it is an extremely efficient way of producing. And you can think of it as a line in which things are being disassembled. That is, an animal, a carcass, is being chopped into its components, each of its components being marketed separately. Chicago butchers prided themselves on packing everything but the pig squeal. This process was extremely efficient. It was based on a very high division of labor. I don't think Adam Smith and his <laughs> wildest nightmares could have imagined anything like the Swift plant in, in Chicago. Uh, but it, did, it did, did become, in some way, a model to a lot of uh, subsequent American manufacturing that is still based on these continuous flow processes. The animals that had started out as mankind's first machines had now been reduced to their component parts. This mass dissection process had consequences far beyond the meat trade. The disassembly line inspired Henry Ford to build his first assembly line 50 years later. Now an entire continent was poised to begin its colossal rise to power. The Industrial Revolution in the New World showed the immense wealth that could be unleashed by a capitalist economy. It was based on the European belief that the roots of prosperity lie in the exploitation of the natural world. My view has always been that the most important thing that explains the advance of technology is sort of the underlying metaphysical assumptions that people have about the connection between them and their, uh, and their environment. If you believe that every tree and every stream and every hill is inhabited by a conscious deity, 
who is jealously guarding his privilege to, uh, to protect uh, uh, his or her territory, you're going to be very reluctant to build mills and to, and to start new farmland because there's always the danger that you're going to unleash some angry being upon you who's stronger than you are. In Europe, in particular in Western Europe, slowly but certainly people come to the realization that in fact the manipulation of the physical world is nothing to be ashamed of, there's nothing to feel guilty about. In fact, if you do so, you're only illustrating the glory of the Creator. The Creator in His infinite wisdom has created something and put us in the middle of it. And He put it at our disposal. The essence of sustained technological progress is the disruption of the harmony with nature. We don't want to live in harmony with nature. We want to keep disrupting it. That is uh, the Western way of doing things. That is why we are rich and everybody else is not. Because if you're going to live in harmony with nature, you may be happy, but you're going to be poor. In the last few decades of our 10,000 year history, the post-industrial human species has evolved quickly. So how different are we from our hunter-gathering ancestors? The story of the Garden of Eden and the loss of innocence is often taken to be the story of the loss of hunting and gathering. Adam and Eve picked the plants, uh, picked the fruits off the trees and lived a simple life without raiment and so on. And that was the life of hunters and gatherers. The fall of man, many people believe, is this long period when you had to work harder to gain a living. And so in many ways the superabundance that machinery produces for at least a few parts of the world is in some ways a return for those fortunate few to a sort of Eden. Just the last 200 years of industrial civilization in many ways is a return to hunting and gathering. If you look at a great city like Chicago or London or Tokyo, you'll find that people act, look like hunters and gatherers in many ways. They rush around, skimming off, not off nature now, but off machinery, the surpluses. They don't have to work with their bodies in the hard way that agricultural peoples had to work. And so, you have a sort of social structure and a way of life which, although it is technologically much more sophisticated, reminds one very much of desert hunters and gatherers. The question is how much more dependent on machines will the human species become? Over the last 10 millennia, machinery has been introduced in industrializing societies to take over burdensome tasks so that machines increasingly embody more and more complex skills which up till then it had, it had been believed only humans could perform. So at the start of the 21st century what's at stake is that those last bastions of what it is to be human, um, the intellect, seem to be being mechanized and at an extraordinary rate. So that the machines around us here are performing tasks which two decades ago would have won you the Nobel Prize. That boundary between what is mechanizable and what is human is constantly shifting in favor of the machine. This room here is a sequencing factory. It's a disassembly line for taking apart samples of DNA and then working out the order of their components. So these computers are working automatically to analyze, order and define a kind of code 
on the basis of which human nature can then be pictured. It's the idea that human nature itself might be expressible as not much more than a kind of rather long ma machine code which has come to dominate a whole host of images of what it is to be human, what human nature is like, what can be synthesized, what can be engineered into existence. Over the last 10,000 years, the human species has become increasingly clever at dissecting and mimicking the natural world for its own ends. The iron horse that impressed Fanny Kemble would not have been possible without the long chain of history that links animal power to steam power. This snorting little animal, which I felt rather inclined to pat, goes upon two wheels, which are her feet, and are moved by bright steel legs called pistons. These are propelled by steam. So what did make the world take off? And why did that spark ignite in Britain? Nature was changed so that the British could profit. Britain was part of a continent that had an abundance of domestic animals. It had the right climate to grow wheat and barley rather than rice. These grains were ground in mills. The monastic tradition laid the foundations for organized work. Idleness is the enemy of the soul. Time becomes something like a piece of cloth with a link that you can sell bits of. There were innovators and entrepreneurs and plenty of coal and iron to fuel their ideas. Iron became the plastic of the age. There was a growing middle class to buy these goods. Luxuries weren't just for the rich. Luxuries were for the people. Being an island, Britain was protected from invasion, but enjoyed the technological benefits of the arms race. Think of a cannon as a kind of one-shot engine. Few of these things were unique to Britain. Most of them came from other cultures and countries. What was unique was their fusing together on one rain-swept island. It was not predestined. A chain of chance and circumstance set the rocket on its fateful journey. The question that remains is just how much further the human species can extend its control over nature. What makes one think that there we may now be at a great turning point is that in the last 50 years, having as many think selfishly manipulated every species on this earth to our advantage, turned them into our own slaves, suddenly we've turned this process on ourselves. We now have turned the mirror of evolutionary adaptation on ourselves and we are modifying our own genetic structures through the discovery of DNA. So we can speed up our own evolution, select what we want. And so from Homo sapiens, there may be developing very soon, if not already, a new species which will replace us as we replace the Neanderthals, a species which I call Homo artificialis, artificial man. It's constructed mankind. We reconstruct ourselves in a new image. We make ourselves into more intelligent, healthier, whatever we like kind of beings, but we're no longer the product of unguided evolution and have modified our genome so much that in another 10,000 years when someone sits here looking at the Himalayas, which will probably be unchanged, it'll be a very different kind of person sitting here and saying a very different kind of thing. <laughs>